Good day, brothers and sisters, and welcome once again to the CMI School of Christ. And uh, we're going to go ahead and continue our class today, The Great Mercy of God. And the last couple, I think it was the last couple classes we, that we've had, we, uh, we've been talking about <clears throat> and just looking at the passage and going a little bit into detail with Genesis 15, uh, like 1 through 6. And I think last class we were looking at the term uh, where it says, and he, the Lord, brought him, brought Abram forth abroad. And the term we were looking at was forth, which is Strong's number uh, 3318. And I wanted to just go ahead and look a little bit more at that term uh, today, a little bit more. And <clears throat> I know we've seen it in, uh, in other verses, like last, last week's with Moses, where Moses went forth, you know, out from the camp to meet with the Lord. And today I just wanted us to look at a couple things concerning that term. And um, I actually came across it while reading the vines, and forgive me if I've, I've already uh, shared that particular vines definitions definition with you all, but um, it just came across my heart again, and just seeing something going on there with that term brought forth, brought him forth. And to get to that, I first want us to read a couple of passages. Actually, they're not a couple, they're about three or four passages, just to kind of get an idea of something. <clears throat> Our first passage is uh, Romans chapter 7, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, verse, we'll, we'll just go ahead and start with verse 20. And the whole, this whole passage, um, we could even read before then. And uh, in, in this whole book of Hebrews, there's just a comparison between the testimony and Christ the greater than, that which testifies of Christ, and Christ the person himself, the greater than. Uh, I can read I'll just, gosh, I don't even know where. Uh, starting with verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken let me mark it right there that I started with verse 13. Okay. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe. Uh, of which no man gave attendance uh, at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Right? Declaring uh, Christ himself uh, out of the tribe, come from the tribe of Judah, of which Moses spake nothing concerning his priesthood. Right? And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily, disannulling, verily a disannulling of the commandment going forth for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. 
for the law made nothing perfect, but bringing in, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, speaking of Christ, for those, those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that saith unto him, but Christ himself with, made, a, made a priest with an oath by him that saith unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22, by so much <clears throat> was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they truly were, and they, they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. <coughs> Excuse me. Forgive me, I know it sounds loud on the audio. Uh, I'm just using a cough drop. Okay, uh, once again, verse 20. 24. But this man made, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests did to offer up sacrifice for first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was uh, since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. And looking at verse uh, 27, who needeth, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself a once and for all, once for all time. And <clears throat> it's just one of the things uh, that we're going to be looking at during this class. And we have a couple other passages of scripture just declaring the same. There is that which is continually, like uh, the priests, when they were a testimony of Christ, uh, doing the service uh, every day, every day, continually, and yet it was never done. The, the, the work was never finished. And yet Christ here, he offers himself once and for all, and he no longer has to offer himself. No, it's a once and for all thing with one sacrifice forevermore. All right, um, here's Hebrews, a little further, here's Hebrews 10, still in the book of Hebrews. Let's start with verse, wow. Well, we could read the whole chapter, but, um, I guess to get a picture of it, we'll just start with verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things. Let me go ahead and look at that first term real quick. Yeah, the image, the perfect image. Christ himself, the perfect image. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make or continually make the comers thereunto perfect. They were continually doing this, the priests. All right, for then, uh, then would they not have ceased to be offered? For then would they not have ceased to be offered? 
because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of, conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said, I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. This is Christ himself. And above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law, then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By which will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. By the, excuse me, uh, through, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body, forgive me, for the, of the body of Jesus Christ once and it is a once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And see, even with the picture of the, of the tabernacle and the temple, the only seat in the whole place was the mercy seat. And no priest sat down because there were, they were continually working. The work was never finished. The, uh, <clears throat> right here, the, the offering of sacrifices and burnt offerings to basically cover the sins of the people. It was never finished. It was a continual thing going on, ongoing, blah, blah, blah. Um, continually never coming to an end. It had to just keep on, keep on, keep on, because it, it was never finished. Verse 12. Or actually, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering, day after day after day, continually throughout the day, and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. All right? But this man, verse 12, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. It is finished. And God, completely satisfied, allows him to sit. It is finished. The work is done. No more needed, no more needed, to be done. No more that needs to be done. It is finished. He sat down. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And just looking at that, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified perfected forever. And you can say, well, I don't see it. I'm not perfect. That's the key. We're looking at ourselves. We're looking at what can be seen with the natural eye. We're looking at what is below. And I'm not, I, please do not misunderstand. I'm not saying that we will be perfect. No. Christ himself is the perfection of the soul of the person. Christ himself, listen to this, is the holiness of the soul, of the person. Apart from him, we know what we are. Apart from him, the one who is not born again, there is no perfection there. There is no holiness there because the Holy One the perfect one is not present. Now, those who are born again, in whom Christ dwells, we are not being made uh, to be perfect. No, he in us 
is our perfection. He in us is our holiness. Because He is holy, He is holy in us. For by one offering, He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. All right, now going on. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us for after that He had said before. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of their, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 22, just our heart, our heart. Let us draw near with a true heart. The heart turns unto the Lord, the heart turning unto the Lord. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that is, that is promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And we're, we have been looking and considering the whole little uh, journey, well, not little, but the journey of Abram. When the day dawns is when the Lord makes himself known, is when God the Father reveals his Son. That is when the day dawns. Look, 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 look at this right here, verse, uh, verse 25, or 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, exhorting, encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Encouraging one another unto what? Unto what? Unto the Lord himself. Unto turning to behold the Lord himself. And just with this whole entire passage, um, the main thing that I really wanted just to stress and, and get across is this, a once and for all thing. Uh, speaking concerning the priests in Hebrews 7 and, and here in Hebrews 10, they were continually offering and they were offering and they were doing and they were continually working. Jesus comes, one offering, one sacrifice, once and for all. He sat down. No more, no more to be done. Nothing more to be done. Uh, I think it was our last class where we said that it was on the cross where Jesus said, it is finished. It is consummated. The consummation is come. There's no more to be done. It is a once and for all thing. And that's a good thing. Because if not, then listen, then our whole salvation, our whole relationship with God would be not sure but Christ himself is the sureness of it. God is satisfied with the Son. His Son is our relationship with God. His Son is our relationship with God. Everything, everything revolves around the Son. Everything does. All right, just another passage here. Um, Exodus chapter 15, verses 13 through 18. We're starting with uh, verse 13. Thou in thy mercy... Here you go, mercy. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. You've led forth the people that you have redeemed. Thou hast guided them, or excuse me, it's Exodus. <clears throat> I think I may have said Ezekiel. It's Exodus chapter 15, verse uh, 13 through 18. Forgive me for that. Um, once again, thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. 
you have led those whom you redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength. You have guided in your strength unto thy holy habitation. Unto thy holy habitation, unto where you yourself dwell. And I, I love this. I didn't have this down written down here in, in my notes, but um, I can go ahead and read it real quick. I think if I can find it, it's just it's a passage in John, and I'll see if if I can find it. And I don't think I'm going to be able to find it. Yeah, yeah, well, it's uh, John, John 14. I'll just start with verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many places of abode. It is a great place of abode. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And I'll just stop right there that where I am, you may be also, that where I dwell, you may be found also. All right. Another passage. Going on from John chapter 14, a little further down. Here's verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me. Because I live, you shall live also. At that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. At that day, until that day dawn in your heart, until the Father reveal the Son, Christ himself, until that time, you do not know where Christ is, that Christ is in union in his Father, we do not know that we are in union with Christ, and we do not know that Christ is found in us until that day dawn. But when that day dawn, when by the work of the Holy Spirit, the heart turns unto the Lord, in that very moment, when that day dawns in our heart, when the Father reveals His Son where He is, at that day we will know that Christ is in his Father, and that we are in Christ, and that he is in us. And it's all based upon the fact, for those who are born again, that Christ is in the soul, that Christ is present in the soul. All right? Now back to Exodus 15. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. You've done this, you've redeemed them. You've led the people that you have redeemed. Where were they redeemed? They were redeemed with the blood of the lamb from Egypt. Well, really Egypt's down over here. So. But there's the cross. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb on the uh, Passover night. Thou in thy mercy, and all this is in the mercy of God, um, hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed Thou hast guided them in thy strength. The Lord has guided 
in his own strength, by his spirit, unto thy holy habitation, unto the very place where God himself dwells. This he has done, all right? It goes on uh, reading, and I want to pick up in, well, the people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of, of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed, and the mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Now, verse 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. The greatness of Christ, the right arm of the Lord. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. Past tense. Already done. Now verse 17. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. But we just read verse 13, the very first verse of this passage right here in Exodus. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people, which thou hast redeemed, thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. So what, what is this with verse 17? Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thyself, for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Here's what's going on. There is a once and for all thing with verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed, thou hast guided in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. There is, a, there is the once and for all reality. Was made, the reality was made manifest with a Passover and then a once and for all. Now, now, what is true what is true in the heavens must be known in the earth. Reality that governs the heavens must now govern the earth. Now, verse 17, thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. In the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. You will bring them in and plant them. You've brought them, you've brought them under reality. Now, now, you also Thou shalt bring them in and plant them. You will br in their, you've brought them, and now, listen to this, listen to the way I'm going to say it, you will bring their hearts and establish them in reality where you have already brought their souls in reality. Do, do you see the... <laughs> the once and for all, and then the knowing of the once and for all, the being established in the once and for all. To plant something means to establish something. That, that's what it is. Uh, a little, uh, like a little plant, if it's just out, is not going to be established. It's never going to take root. It's never going to be established and grow and flourish. All right, but if you take that and you plant it somewhere, then it, it's more likely to be established. Well, that's just a natural example. Right here, the Lord hath, hath, 
half. Verse 13, thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed, thou hast guided thou in thy strength unto thy holy habitation, where you yourself dwell, the habitation of God. Remember uh, John 14, one through three? In, my, in my, my father's house, my father's abode, it is a great dwelling abode. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, Listen, if I go, I will surely come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, question. And this pertains for those who are born again. Question. Did Jesus go? Yes. Yes, he certainly did. He did go. Where did he go? It was in the cross, in the death, burial, resurrection, that's where go. That's where he left. And then the question is, did he come again? Yes. Yes. Came at the day of Pentecost. And then for us who are born again, he comes at the moment of new birth. Because he comes to fill his house to fill his temple, to fill his land with himself. Let's go ahead and read it again. Now, I don't want to shake up your thoughts concerning these passages, but um, I do want to just show something that there is reality and then there's, listen, then there's the knowing, there's the coming, there's the heart coming from one understanding to the understanding of God, from the understanding of man to the understanding of God, right? And if I go, or verse two, in my father's house, great place of abode, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. Verse three, but we're in John chapter 14 again. And if I go and prepare a place for you, which he did in the cross, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. That is reality as it is known in the heavens above. That is why the Lord continually stresses, lift now thine eyes, lift now, look now towards heaven and behold reality as it is the person of Christ himself. That where I am, you may be also. Uh, last class, we looked at Colossians chapter 3. In that day, uh, well, well, I'll just go ahead and read down further, verse 20, because Jesus says, says it himself. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. In that day, apart from that day, you do not know, but in that day, at that day, you will know. And then I think it was our last class, we uh, looked at Colossians chapter three. <clears throat> if ye then be risen with Christ, and he was speaking to those who were born again, he was speaking to the Colossians, those who were born again. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on that which is above, not on that which is on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with God in Christ. Excuse me, for your and your life is hid with Christ in God. I said it backwards. Verse four, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear in that day, at that day, then shall you also appear with him in glory. It shall become very evident unto you. Ye shall know, I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. At that day.
what is true in the heavenlies governing the earth. But how? By learning what is true in the heavenlies? No. By seeing him who remains. At that day, you will know I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. It is seeing the one who remains. It's always, it is always seeing Christ. So right here, um, verse 17, Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for, thy, for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. You've done this, and you are going to establish them in this. And from that point, from here, from the heart being established in reality, and once again, when I, I point to the map here, uh, the area of Canaan, and I'm, it's not a, as, geog as a geographic place, it is more of a testimony of the one who fills the land, the soul. Christ who fills the soul. Christ who fills the land. That's how we're looking at it right there. Uh, from here, from beholding above, from lifting the eyes at this day, from being established in the truth, in the light, in Christ, from here, verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. From here, this is what governs the heart. Regardless of what is seen on the earth, regardless of what is seen in the natural, the Lord reigns forever and ever. Because the Lord is the only one who remains. All right, now, <clears throat> the last passage right here uh, concerning these verses, and then we'll look at Genesis again. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Verse 2. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the, out of the mountains, saying, Thou shalt uh, say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, verse 4, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. You saw what I did to the Egyptians, and I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Death, burial, resurrection. It began for right there in this passage, Exodus 19, it began with Israel in Egypt, the abode of the dead. And the Lord brings death unto death with the death of the firstborn, with the Passover, the death, then the burial, the Red Sea, and then resurrection, the sun coming forth in resurrection. But see how he speaks to these. Say to the house of Jacob, tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Reality. And that's uh, chapter 19, verse uh, 15. All, both these are in Exodus. The Lord is saying, I will plant you. I will plant you. All right. Uh, back to um, chapter 19. And brought you unto myself. And you can say... You can add basically John chapter 14 verses, I think it was 18, that where I am, you may be also. 
I have brought you unto myself, that where I am ye may be also. All right. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and then it goes on, and I don't want to read the go on, except for this part, for all the earth is mine, period. But see, verse 5, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and we have wild concepts about this, but listen, what does it mean to obey the voice of the Lord? What does it mean to obey his voice? It is simply to turn to see the voice. There obedience is found, all right? The Lord appears unto our father Abram, Abraham when he is in uh, Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. The God of glory appears and he becomes obedient unto that appearing. He is born again. The appearing of the Lord made him obedient to be born again. Now, before the Lord appeared, the Lord had been preparing the ground of Abram's heart for his appearing. Surely, yes, yes. It's always like that. The Lord initiates. The Lord is continually preparing, by his spirit, continually preparing the ground of the heart for an appearing of the Lord, okay? Now, Abram in Haran, I don't know how I got that spot there. Abram in Haran, his heart is being prepared and the Lord speaks. The Lord doesn't appear in Haran, remember? The Lord speaks again to Abram in Haran. He speaks purpose. And in speaking purpose, the Lord makes Abram obedient unto the voice. And what does that mean? Abram comes to see the voice that speaks with him. He comes unto the end, unto the goal, unto the purpose, and the Lord appears in Shechem, Shechem, Sikkim. That is being obedient unto the voice. Obedience unto the voice is defined, you can say perfectly defined, uh, in the book of Revelation chapter one, maybe verses, it's in the teens I think, but where, where the Apostle John is on the Isle of Patmos, and he says, and I heard a voice that spake unto me. And then he says this, and I turned to see the voice, and he sees a beautiful picture of Christ. And then John says this, and when I saw him, he was made obedient unto the voice if you will obey my voice, okay? So all, all that is just to show what we've already uh, stated with, with the Abram and the journey. At the moment of new birth, at the moment of new birth, and we're just using the journey of Abram as an example, at the moment of new birth, Christ is present in the soul. You, you could not be born again, you could not be saved, you could not uh, have life except Christ be present because Christ is life. Christ is salvation. Christ is the birth of the soul, the new birth of the soul, Christ himself. So at that very moment, Christ is present. We do not see him who is present. Therefore, we do not know him who is present. And yet, it is all with purpose to come to see the land that is filled with the one who is present. Always coming towards this end, always geared, always going in this motion to come to behold him who is present, who fills heaven and earth. All right? And that was the thing. Okay, our verse again uh, with Genesis 15, verse 5. And he brought him forth, the Lord brought Abram forth abroad, out of, out of the natural realm, out of uh, the realm of natural sight and natural sound, out of 
the realm of the senses, the natural senses, okay? The Lord brought Abram forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Behold the increase of the seed. Behold the resurrection. Behold the risen Lord. Behold the risen Son of God. All right. Now what I wanted to get to, vines. All, I read those passages just so we could, just so we could see that there is a once and for all work of God, a once and for all reality of God that comes with the appearing of Christ. Remember? Uh, Israel, Egypt, they would have... Re they would have continued in Egypt had the Passover lamb not appeared. They would have continued in Egypt. But because the Passover lamb appeared, who is a testimony of Christ himself, everything changed. No longer under the dominion of death. No longer governed by death. No longer governed by, listen, bondage. No longer. All because of the appearing of the Passover lamb, who is a type of Christ. Okay. So there's a once and for all, back with the children of Israel, uh, with Exodus, there's a once and for all reality that's taken place. I brought you with eagle's wings, resurrection, unto myself, reality. Now, Plant them, plant them, establish them. In Christ, the reality of God. Now to be established, now to be established, beholding the one who is present. And understand, the goal is not to be established. The goal is beholding the one who is present. In beholding the one who is present, the heart will be established. Now, in continuing to behold the one who is present, the heart will continue to be established. Vine's Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words, uh, the, the phrase, get out, go forth, Strong's number 3318. It's, uh, I guess, a Hebrew word we're looking at in the verb, as a verb, yasta, something like that, yasta. Forgive me for the pronunciation. Um, it's basically uh, translated in, in the uh, English, I guess the King James, but in, in the English as to come forth, go out, proceed, go forth, bring out, come out. I like the to come forth. Uh, the second paragraph says this, basically this word means movement away from some point, even as bo, bo, come, means movement towards some point. Yasta is the word used for coming forth. The observer is outside the point of departure but also speaks from the perspective of that departing point. The observer is outside the point of departure. The Lord had already brought Abram out unto. It was at the moment when the God of glory first appeared. Already. Already. And yet the Lord now draws the heart of Abram out unto where he has brought, he hath brought the soul of Abram in reality. Now, concerning Abram, I'm speaking uh, testimony-wise. They are they that testify of Christ. And Jesus said this, John 5, 39. You search the scriptures in them, you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. But then he says this, 
and you will not come unto me, saying that the testimony must serve the purpose of God to bring unto Christ, to come unto Christ. So, the Lord, when the God of glory first appears unto Abram, on eagle's wings, unto myself. I have brought you on eagle's wings unto myself. Now, the heart is being established. The Lord, uh, Genesis 15, brought him, how does it read again? And he brought, the Lord brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven. Out of the natural, brought the heart unto reality. So that there can be in type a day dawning in the heart of Abram. The heart coming unto the Lord. With a day dawn, and at that day ye shall know I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. All right? The observer is outside the point of departure, but also speaks from the perspective of that departing point. The observer is outside that point of departure. Departure from a condition, the condition of death under the condition of life. Departure from ignorance governing unto the truth governing, reality governing. Departure from the natural, physical realm unto reality. I love it. All right. The observer is outside the point of departure, but also speaks from the perspective of that departing point. For example, Genesis 2.10, the first occurrence of the word reports that a river came forth or flowed out from the Garden of Eden. In comparison to this continuing going out, because from Genesis, for example, Genesis uh, 2.10, came forth a river coming forth, flowing out, continually, 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 and see, that's the thing. There is a once and for all, and then there is a continual, the heart, continually turning unto the Lord, turning to behold him who fills the land, and not getting caught up with something on the earth, something in the natural realm, something in a physical map, physical terrain map on the globe, but being caught up with reality, with the Lord himself. Look now toward heaven, above. Not below, but above. In comparison to this continuing going out, because that, that is what it is. It is a continual turning unto the Lord. We, we've said it before. Continuing to walk in faith, continuing to walk in the light, continuing to walk in repentance, a continual turning unto the Lord. All right. In comparison to this continuing going out, there is the one time, one time punctiliar coming forth, as seen with all the animals came out of the ark. And then it gives Genesis 9:10. And see. There's, there always has to be the one and one and once and for all, the one time, the once and for all. And yet the heart, the heart must continually be turning, turning from unto, turning from unto, turning from unto.
being established. Thus, the heart being established. There's always the once and for all. Jesus said, it is finished. He offered himself once and for all, never to be offered again. He sat down at the right hand of God. There's no more to be done. No more. God has, God needs to do nothing. It is finished. Jesus said it himself, it is consummated. It is finished. All that remains is to behold that which is finished. And please understand, it is not a that, but it is a him who remains because it is finished. Uh, there was a, where is it? I know that somewhere around here, they had an example, yeah, yeah, of Goliath, the champion of the Philistines in uh, 1 Samuel 17.4. And they, what Vines was saying was basically in, in those times, a whole entire, well, I'll just go ahead and read it. Now, thus Goliath, uh, the champion of the Philistines, went forward from the camp to challenge the Israelites to a duel. In the art of ancient warfare, a battle was sometimes decided on the basis of two duelers. So, that's it. You have Goliath declaring lies, and then you have David, who's only been listening to the Lord. And here is a whole war And the victory will be determined upon whomever remains. Whomever remains will be the victor. And that will determine who won the war. And we all know the story. David slew Goliath. Goliath died. Who remained? David. The war is over. David won. It's just a testimony of Christ in the death, burial, resurrection. <laughs> by one sacrifice, by one offering, once and for all. Now it is to behold, listen, him who remains. Because we think Goliath remains. Whatever our concept of Goliath is, whether he be the enemy or the natural governing nature of man, it doesn't matter. It is now to behold him who remains. And him who remains, remains, listen, alive. Once again, with the children of Israel, when the Passover lamb appeared, the Lord brought the condition of death unto death. One of the confessions of, of the Egyptians was, we be dead. Let's go ahead and look it up real quick. I haven't shared that in a long time. <laughs> But uh, it's good to just read the, per the, the passage. Yeah. I'll just go ahead and write it down, jot it down, so I don't forget it. It's uh, Exodus chapter 12. Verse 33, and the Egyptians were urgent. Well, let's see. Verse 33, and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people 
that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We all dead. We be all dead men. We all dead. One death, the Lord brings a whole condition of death unto death. So who is that that is living? Israel. But it is Israel is my son, even my firstborn. It is Christ who lives and remains. Once again, with, uh, with the book of Revelation, when John turns to see the voice, he says, and I saw him. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me and declared, I fear not, I am he that liveth. I am the living one was dead the Passover lamb behold I am alive forevermore I am the one who lives forevermore I am the victor forevermore all right so going back uh, to this passage here uh, Let's see, one, two, three. Going on with uh, Vine's Expository Dictionary, I think this is like the fourth paragraph. It says, this verb may be used with come. Strong's number 935, the Hebrew is something like bo or bo, as an expression for constant activity. The raven Noah sent out went forth to and fro, literally in and out in and out until the water had abated. And that's Genesis uh, chapter 8, verse 7, and I got a note to read uh, verses 1 through 20, the whole thing. <clears throat> and I know we've looked at these uh, passages a little bit in a couple classes past, but this is what really got my attention. It is that there is a once and for all a once and for all reality that has taken place and what now remains is the beholding of this reality. Uh, he sends forth the raven. The raven, listen, that went literally in and out. In and out. In, and this is, this is, this is uh, after the the Lord put a shut on all the waters of the flood. The raven who goes in this creation and out of the ark. Out of, listen, like the tomb. Beholding that which is new. Beholding, listen, the new creation. Beholding, listen, that which remains. until finally Noah also went forth and beheld the face of the ground, that it was dry. Beholding him who remains. <clears throat> there is a continual beholding of the Lord. There is for this class, what I've wanted to do is just show that there is a once and for all bringing out of, or we'll do it this way, bringing out of unto the Lord himself. There's a once and for all. This happens, uh, the soul experiences this at the moment of new birth. A bringing out of a condition of death unto a condition of life. The Lord does this at the moment of new birth. We are brought, our souls are brought in reality, as the scriptures say, on eagle's wings unto the Lord himself, that where he is, we may be also. Now, the heart being governed by reality is another thing. And yet the heart, the soul is purposed to come to the end, the soul came unto the end, and now the heart in understanding must come 
unto the end where the Lord hath brought the soul in reality from the moment of new birth. And that is seen with our journey of Abram. Get thee out from thy land, from thy kindred, unto a land I will show thee. Unto a land I will show thee. The only expectation God gave Abram. He repeats it unto Abram when Abram comes short and remains in Haran. The Lord doesn't appear in Haran. We know that. He just speaks unto Abram in Haran. Get out from thy land, from thy kindred, and now he adds from thy father's house, because where you are abiding is not where, listen, is not where your life is found. Out from unto a land I will show thee. And the land that God shows is the land that is filled with himself. Because it says, and Abram came into the land of Canaan, came unto Shechem, 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 and the Lord appeared. Once again with the Apostle Paul. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, there's the calling, new birth, reality come once and for all, and the calling unto purpose, that the heart may be established in purpose, that the heart may behold the change, that the heart may behold the reality, that the heart may behold him who is present. Call me by his grace to reveal his son in me. And then the effects, the results of that, I preach him. So, <clears throat> with this class, I'll just uh, end for this class, but that's the one thing I wanted to stress, and forgive me that I kept you guys a bit late, uh, is that there is a once and for all. The once and for all finished work took place in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That once and for all finished work comes into our soul at the moment of new birth. That reality appears in our soul at the moment of new birth. And now, well, it is not just and now, it is and continuing we are to behold the one who remains. So forgive me, I, I'm not sure if I, I uh, communicated this the way, the, way I'm, the way it's in my heart, but there is a once and for all. The Lord hath brought us out unto himself, and now the heart must continue to behold him who is present, the one who is present, he himself who is present. From here, from this moment onward, I have appeared unto thee for, for this purpose, to constitute thee a minister and a witness of this, thy seeing me, and thy seeing me hereafter, from this moment onward. So, with that, I'll let you all go, and uh, maybe we just, you know, present this to the Lord, and just ask him to, call, to, to prepare the ground of our heart so that we may behold this great change that has taken place at the moment of new birth. The, the, the great eternal change that has come into our soul, that we may behold this change as the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So here, we'll let you go for this class. We'll see you in our next class. The Lord bless. Amen.